not only on sessions, but uh, tape editing. And my primary focus was up the stairs in the back on the first floor, cutting records. And as Rupert pointed out, uh, we were still dealing in the early 70s, because I'm going to take you back to the early 70s, we were dealing with AM radio, and AM radio hated things over three minutes and 30 seconds. They really detested. Hence, John got to do a lot of editing. And so I have to take you back pre-digital, and I actually brought in a piece of quarter-inch analog tape, and this is what John would have cut, or I would have cut, under his direction. And uh, how many of you remember Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon? Okay. It was a big hit for us, and it was doing well, but Promotion and a and decided that we needed to, to put out a single on the track, Money. Money was interesting in that it had a bad word. And we couldn't say that bad word on AM radio and FM maybe late at night. And so John got involved on how to fix this, and not only to fix the, the track length, but to take care of this bad word. So I was booked with John, he came down, and uh, we made a tape copy of Money, and he told me where to cut, and we took out a couple of choruses and verses and maybe a long sax solo, but we had to deal with the bad word. And so there was a little section just a little bit shorter than this that went da 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 and so John with his genius knew what to do so I rocked the tape around the beginning of bull s we cut on the marked it with a grease pencil and then we took this piece of tape that John had me cut and we dropped it in but the interesting thing that you'll be interested in I've never done this since is most of the time when you do an edit, you edit to a hi-hat or a cymbal crash or a bass note or something that you can hear just by rocking the tape back. But oh no, John had a trick, which I thought was amazing. And we actually took the piece of tape with the da-da-da on it, and I put it up where the S started, and we actually <coughs> measured, and he says, okay. And we dropped this piece of tape in, and so the, the line goes, don't give me none of that goody-good bull Da, 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 da. And so we fixed the problem. I cut a ref and went upstairs, got approved, and the rest is history. But I found that so interesting, and I, I remembered that for years to come. Another story, and realized that as we got into the late 80s, um, we became very independent. My paycheck always came from capital, but we were working for RCA and Arista and uh, Electra and doing a lot of outside labels in the cutting rooms, which was fun because you got a broad spectrum and you knew what was going on with the good engineers and so forth. And Clive Davis wanted me to do a single, and I don't remember, I'm sorry, the artist or what the song was, but Clive Davis was noted for these very convoluted edits. And I took a crack at it, and I didn't like it. It, was, it didn't sound right musically. John it's Ken and mastering. Would you come help me, please? <laughs> and so John came down. Luckily, he wasn't busy at the moment. And I played him the track. And then I told him what Clive Davis wanted me to do with this. And he goes, he what? And he says, OK, make me a copy. And he went back upstairs. And he played with it for about half a day. And the next day, he says, Ken, are you available? I said, yes. So he came back down. He says, OK. And this is what we did. And we put it together. And it was convoluted, I mean, really. And little pieces of tape going here and moving, and then 16 bars, and then another cut. And we cut a ref and sent it to Clive Davis, and I got a phone call, accept it, it's fine. But without John's help, I would have never been able, I would have probably gone some, someplace else. But uh, as everybody so far has said, you can't say enough about John. He was so easy to work with. And I worked on the Joy of Cooking album with John in Studio A, which looked a lot different than it does now. And as a second engineer, meaning I take, took care of the tape logs and ran the tape machines. And I think Jay Ranalucci did the mixing on that, the recording. But we spent weeks. And one thing that I remember is it took all day just to get the drum sound. And I was just flabbergasted how anybody could spend so much time getting a kick drum to sound this thud-a-thud -thud that they wanted. 
but John was cool, calm, and collected, and very easy to work with. And I think the album was a, a moderate success, a pretty good success. But anyway, it was a pleasure to work with him, and thank you all for coming. Well, hi, my name is uh, Stephen K. Peoples. Um, I'm a former capital colleague of John's. Um, I was about 23 or 24 in the late 70s, 1977, when uh, I started working here with Dan Davis in the Press and Artist Relations Department. But my real love was hanging around in the studio. And I did that as much as I possibly could before they chased me out. They'd, they'd say, uh, you can stay here until such and such session starts, and then you got to go. But uh, John was always the guy who said it was okay for me to hang out in Studio A. And um, his, uh, his um, friendliness and his willingness to share what he knew with younger people like me who were fascinated by what he did, uh, was a great thing. He also let me hang around with, with Ken and Wally in the mastering rooms. And uh, it was quite something to witness these guys working. But uh, John and I had uh, um, a pretty neat relationship. There was a point where the, the uh, Studio B received its first NECAM computer-assisted mixing desk and he was involved in installing that and I got to write a story about that and he was one of the principal people along with John Krauss that, uh, that I interviewed for that and it was a, a great experience for me being a, a, a lifelong Capitol Records person and uh, now my god I'm working here. Um, he, uh, John, um, I left in 1980 uh, to uh, take an equivalent job at Electra Asylum Records a couple of years later, John retired in 82 after 33 years at Capitol. He'd started in 1949 and uh, originally worked at the first studios on Melrose uh, before moving to the Tower, which opened in 56. And uh, uh, John was, um, how do I put this? He was, he was just so willing to share what he knew. I knew other producers and other engineers who were, wanted to keep the cards close to the chest and, and not divulge their tricks like, like he would with, uh, with Ken. And it was a great thing. Um, after I left, he and I lost contact, but the time that I spent hanging around in the studio served me well. A few years later, I had an opportunity to uh, take a, a writing and producing job at Westwood One Radio Networks and uh, did that for eight and a half years. But when I walked into the Westwood One studios, it was not a foreign environment. It was completely uh, familiar to me because of the time that I'd been able to spend in Capitol Studios, largely because John let me do it. Um, we lost touch. Uh, probably for 30 some odd years and uh, I did not know that he moved to my neighborhood to Newhall California I live in Santa Clarita probably about four miles away I was reading the local newspaper and there was some reference to Friendly Valley and a meeting of the, the board and so forth Friendly Valley was the retirement community that he lived in in, in Newhall and there was a name a board member John Palladino and I, my god could that be the same guy a couple of phone calls later, I found out it was the same guy. Um, and I was at the time writing for the local newspaper, The Signal, and uh, went to my editor and said, there's a really, really famous guy living in our neighborhood, and we need to, we need to write about him. We need to let the community know who this guy is and what he's done. So, uh, so the editor said, and you're sure he's local? I said, yes, Newhall, Newhall. And they said, okay. So I got the green light. I was able to write four stories about John, which were um, labors of love for me. I got to spend 
many hours with him in his uh, living room and hearing, his, hearing him recount the stories, uh, some of which you've heard tonight, uh, I think, or today rather. And um, uh, during, the, uh, during the writing of this, my car died. And I was without a car. And I just happened to mention, I went over to his house and we were doing interviews and he says, how you doing? And I says, well, my car just died. And he says, well, you know, I have an extra car. Would you like to borrow mine? <laughs> and I kind of, you know, are you crazy? And so we went out to the, we went out to the, to the garage and there's a, a, a red 911 uh, Porsche <laughs> and a, a, a four door big white Lincoln like a white whale, and, and he opens up the garage door, he says, not the Porsche. <laughs> I said, I didn't figure. So, so John loaned me the big car that he and Evelyn used to drive around town for about three weeks until I got my car out of the shop. But who does that anymore? He didn't charge me any money. He didn't like call me every day and say, is the car still okay? Did, is, have you had a wreck or anything? It was uh, just amazing, but I think that's, that's really, um, th that really illustrates the kind of person that he was. Above and beyond all the professional accomplishments, which are massive and, and which are extremely influential and which every young engineer who follows him should know about and should study. Uh, beyond all of that, John as a person, I think, uh, and the family will attest, uh, was a, a very multifaceted person. If you look at just his professional career, you get a, a, a that's a wonderful thing, but it's a monodimensional view. When you, when you consider the fact that he was a pilot, he was a photographer, he made stained glass art, he was a builder, he built two cabins, he dug a swimming pool. I saw pictures of him like digging and laying cement in a swimming pool. What could he not do? This was, this was an amazing, amazing guy. And the cool thing about it, I was talking with Chuck Granada, who wrote the, the book that John is holding in that photo there about Frank Sinatra. And Chuck was telling me that, that uh, yeah, and he did all of this while being a nice guy. <laughs> When you think about all the accomplishments that he did and all the p potential uh, conflicts and problems that could have happened that he finessed, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, he told me one story, speaking of Mr. Snips, which was a, a nickname that Steve Meyer told me they had, they had given him, Mr. Snips, because of his editing skills. Uh, he he uh, told me about one task that he got was uh, Band on the Run by uh, Paul McCartney and Wings. And uh, he was up in San Francisco. He was producing a Joy of Cooking album at the time. And they said, uh, the Capitol folks down here said, oh, we need, we need to release this as a signal, uh, single. We need an edit, but we can't get a hold of Paul. Can you just go ahead and do it? And so he said, okay. So he like stopped down his Joy of Cooking session got the tape up there. Maybe you were there when this happened. I don't know, Ken, but he, sto he sto it says he stopped the session, took the McCartney tape, rocked it around, rocked it back and forth, figured out where to, where to make the edits, brought it in under time, and sent it back to, uh, to the tower. It was released as a single, went to number one. Uh, and I, I asked him, well, what did McCartney think about this? Did, did you ever talk to him about it? Or he says, well, actually, we did run into each other at an event afterward, and he didn't say a thing about it. <laughs> um, I've heard from other sources, uh, particularly Rupert, that Paul was not really crazy about it uh, happening because he didn't know about it. Not that it wasn't a good edit, just that he didn't have the foreknowledge of it. But uh, uh, there you go. And how many people thinking... Thinking about that track now, and it was a huge single, it was a number one hit, it was played all over the world. And when you listen to the single and you listen to the album version, the stuff that he took out was the right stuff. Because what's left is just the perfect essence of the record. 
with no, all killer, no filler, would be another way to put it. So um, I was uh, very honored when, uh, when the family contacted me after uh, John passed away and asked me to write the, the obituary for him, uh, which I really don't like writing obituaries, but um, in certain cases, it's a control thing. I wanted to make sure that it got done right. And I didn't want to let somebody else do it that may or may not have uh, had the institutional knowledge, if you will, of capital and of John and of the community that we lived in. So it was a great honor, and I thank you again for, for allowing me to do that. And uh, we've created, uh, actually the family's created a tribute website uh, where you can uh, log on and we'll I, I think the URL, uh, the address of it is on the, on the sheet here somewhere. Yes, um, there's an address there and you can, you can go to that address and upload pictures. You can uh, leave a story, leave a, mem um, a memory if you like, that would be really cool. And we've also got, we've also set up a John Palladino Facebook page. Uh, 